Welcome to New Life Assembly of God Media Ministry. We are glad that you are here. We believe the Word of God is relevant and life-changing, and we hope you can be blessed by this message. Amen. If you'll take your scriptures in hand and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to be reading verses 4 and 5 in just a moment. We're continuing our Back to Church series titled Forever Family. Church is more than a place to go. And this morning's message is titled You Belong Here. You Belong Here. In a Psychology Today article titled Belonging for Belonging, author Robert Wilson explores the basic human need to be loved and accepted by a group. And he writes, the desire to belong is a universal human need that is found in all cultures. He says it's a powerful motivator that dates back to ancient times when belonging to a clan or a tribe meant the difference in whether or not you would survive. Psychologist Abraham Maslow in his Hierarchy of Human Needs lists the need for loving, love and belonging on the third tier right behind physical food and the need for personal safety and security. But once those survival needs are met, we need and seek love and belonging. Wilson goes on to state in his article that family is the first group where we belong. He writes, we don't get to choose which family we have. And the overall function or dysfunction of our immediate family has long-term impacts on our life. If you come from a loving, supportive household, you will most likely grow up confident and self-assured and find it easy to belong to new groups in your life. On the other hand, if you come from an emotionally unstable household, chances are that you will grow up fearful and uncertain, and even though you have that need to be loved and belong, it will be difficult for you to trust and to be able to um, accept those relationships in your life to belong. Today, because of the breakdown of family and marriage, many people have come from dysfunctional families, leaving them broken, hurting and lonely because the past often keeps them from trusting and committing to love others. And of course, many today are separated from uh, their their, uh, natural family by distance. In previous generations, people didn't travel to far places. And and so everyone grew up surrounded by aunts and uncles and and, and cousins. The extended family was a regular part of your life, but that is not so today. And with the rise of social media and the lack of investing in real life relationships, all of this has led to what is being called an epidemic of loneliness and isolation, particularly here in the United States, and it has led to negative impacts on both our physical and mental health. People are longing for authentic community, to engage in genuine relationships with like-minded people where they will be loved and they will have a sense of belonging and purpose. But there is no better place to experience that than in church. We're going to read first in Ephesians 2.19, then we're going to uh, cut back to Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. The scripture says in Ephesians 2.19, so now you Gentiles, and in the Bible the word Gentiles really referred to, first of all, anybody that was not Jewish. So you had two categories of people, Jews and Gentiles. But in particular, um, on a, in a spiritual aspect, the Gentiles uh, in this verse refers to anybody who was unsaved, that did not know God. So it says, so now you Gentiles, those that did not know the one true God, you are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. Now that's a reference to Israel, but not just Israel, the nation. In this verse, it's referring to the Jewish people who had accepted Jesus Christ as Savior. So he says, you're no longer are strangers and foreigners you are citizens along with all of God's holy people you are members of God's family hallelujah the church is not a place we go the church is a family that we belong to amen in his book purpose driven life by Rick Warren he says God wants a family and he created you to be a part of it this is one of God's purposes for your life which he planned before you were born another uh, Christian uh, scholar and, and, and minister Stephen Sizer in a message titled formed for God's family writes the entire Bible is the story of God building a family who will love him honor him and reign with him forever 
And in Ephesians 5, 1, it says, God decided in advance. Some versions say predestined us. It just means God had a plan from before we were born. Predestined us, it was a part of God's unchanging plan, to adopt us into his own family by bringing us unto himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. God wanted you as his son and daughter, and he devised a plan that would cost him the life of his own son to wash away our sins and make it possible for us to be a part of his family. That is not something that we should take lightly. Being a part of a church family cost Jesus his life. It is not something we should take lightly. So the church is not a building. It's not a service. It's not programs, even though all of those things are an important part of our spiritual growth and journey. But the church is the family of God. As one writer states, the primary identity of the people of God is to be a family. The primary identity of the people of God is to be a family. The moment we receive Jesus Christ as Savior, we are born again, and we are not born as orphans. We are born into a new family with God as our Father and every believer as our brothers and sisters in Christ. That literally happens the moment that we're born again. But we need to, even though we are a member of the family of God that extends to every believer on the face of the earth and those who have preceded us into heaven, so we have a great big family but even though we're a part of a great big family we need to uh, adjoin ourselves to a local family of God where we can build relationships with one another now in the new testament <clears throat> refers to believers as brothers and sisters in Christ that family concept brothers and sisters in Christ 139 times now if God says something once it's important if he says it twice, it's very important. If he says it 139 times, hallelujah, we better pay attention. And, and, and being brothers and sisters in Christ was a radical concept in the New Testament because the term brother or sister in that culture was reserved only for blood relatives. As one scholar states, by using this term that refers to the most important family bond, God is telling us that as Christians, the most important group bond in our life is the spiritual ties that we share within the church, the family of God. What a blessing it is to be a part of the family of God. I had a conversation with a lady a few years ago who was widowed and is separated by distance and lifestyle from her children who are busy with their own lives and families. And she said to me one day with tears in her eyes, she said, the church is my family. The church is my family. Another sister in Christ spoke to me a couple years ago and she had gone through a lot of hardship and loss in her life, including the loss of an adult son. And she said, the church is the place where I feel most at home. It's where I find peace and comfort. The church, the people of God, are the relationships that are there with us through all the stages of life. They are there with us to pray with us, to encourage us, to support us, to enjoy life together with us, to share life together with us, and they will spend eternity together with us. Amen. 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 So we better get along and love each other. Because eternity is a very long time. And could you just imagine if you don't like somebody and God puts their mansion right next to yours? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> the church is God's forever family. And what a blessing to be a part of it. The Bible says, we read it earlier in Ephesians 2, we were once strangers and foreigners, but we are now family. You know, there was a time when we didn't know each other, right? And maybe we didn't even have much in common. But now our relationship with God through Christ unites us and connects us as a part of God's forever family. Hallelujah. And it's amazing, isn't it, how you can meet someone for the first time who is a fellow believer and you immediately feel a connection with them. You feel as though you've known them a long time. 
Why? Because we are a part of the family of God, united in our common relationship with Jesus Christ. And you feel that when you meet other believers. As we look at the importance that God places on the church as his forever family, it challenges us to move beyond just attending services to truly belong, to truly be a part of and participate in the wonderful family of God. See, something we need to understand, it's not enough just to love God. We must also love the family of God. It's his family. And he loves his family. So we can't just love him without loving his family. In fact, Christ loved the church so much that he died for it. He died to make it possible. And despite the deep love that Christ has for the church, research indicates that Christians are leaving the church in record numbers. Though most of them would say that they've not stopped loving or believing in in Jesus or God. You know, maybe they got hurt in church or the church disappointed their expectations in some way. But so many former churchgoers have espoused what is called a Jesus, yes, church, no mentality. I love Jesus, but I don't need to go to church. That's not biblical, folks. It's not biblical. The truth is that the church is not a perfect community. The church is made up of a whole bunch of imperfect, sinful people like me and like you. Amen? None of us has attained perfection. If we had, we'd already be in heaven because that's when the Bible says that we will be glorified, we'll attain perfection. So if you're still here, hallelujah, it means you're not yet perfect. Praise the Lord. And so that means that even though we might be sincere in loving Jesus and that we desire to be like him, we will often fall short. And when we fall short, Sometimes we may offend or disappoint or hurt one another. Amen? But you know what? Many of us in our natural families have family members that did us wrong. Or we have family members that are hard to get along with. I know because I do. But we don't stop being a part of our family just because we have a difficult family member or somebody hurt us, right? And just as our biological families are not perfect, our spiritual family is not perfect either because it is made up of flawed human beings. And as someone has said, if you find a perfect church, don't join it because you'll ruin it. (laughs) Amen? Church is made up of imperfect people, but that's a part of us growing spiritually is learning to love and forgive one another and walk together in unity. Amen? So despite all our flaws and failures, God is still madly in love with his church. Can you imagine if someone wanted to be your close friend, but they didn't like your spouse, and they didn't like your children, and they wanted nothing to do with your family? Could you imagine having a close relationship with someone that felt that way towards your family? No, of course not. It would be difficult to have any kind of close relationship with them. When you're close friends with someone, then that love extends to their family as well. So when we say we love Jesus, the Bible says that the church is the bride of Christ. So we can't love Jesus and hate his bride or not care about his bride we got to love his bride as well. Amen? When we say we love Jesus, but we don't want anything to do with this church, we are saying the same thing as someone who would want to be our friend, but say, I can't stand your family. And not only is the church the bride of Christ, but as the church, we are the children of God. And God loves his children so much that he sacrificed his own son so that we could be adopted as his sons and daughters. Jesus paid the same price for me that he paid for you. Amen. He loves me. He loves you. Even though we are all still imperfect individuals. And if we love God, 
we've got to love the church that he is madly in love with. The church is not an entity, it's not a building, it's not an organization, it is God's family. And he loves his family deeply. First John chapter 4, verses 20 to 21 says this. If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. Some versions say our brothers, speaking again of that family relationship in the body of Christ. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers or our brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, here is this concept of loving the family of God, the church. The church is not an organization. It is a fellowship of believers. It is a family of God. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are the family of God. And we cannot love God if we do not love his church. If we, will, if we love God truly, we will love what God loves, and he deeply loves the church with all of its imperfections. We are a people in process. The Bible says we are being perfected into the image of Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. We are being perfected. We are not perfect. We are in process. We are being perfected into the image of Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit. And that means that we still fail. That means we still fall short. And a part of our spiritual growth in becoming more like Jesus is learning to forgive when others fail us, when others hurt us, when others disappoint us. And it is learning to love despite our imperfection. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of faults. Amen? Second principle, in the family of God, we are loved and we learn to love unconditionally. In the family of God, we are loved unconditionally. John 13, 34 says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. How has he loved us? He has loved us unconditionally. He doesn't love us because we earned it. He doesn't love us because we deserve it. He doesn't love us because, oh, we're so cute and lovable. No. We were sinners. We were his enemies. And when we were at our worst, he showed us how much he loved us by dying for us. How much more now then, Paul says. So unconditional love doesn't mean that we blindly condone, approve, or accept everything that someone does. You know, that, that's a concept in the world today, right? That to love somebody means that you accept everything, every behavior, but not so. Jesus demonstrated that in his instruction to a woman who was caught in the act of adultery and was brought before him by the religious leaders and thrown before him to command him or to force him to stone her to death, which was the penalty of the Old Testament law for sexual immorality. And what did he say to her? To her? Well, first of all, he told the group that had gathered demanding her to be put to death, he said, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. What does that mean, folks? We are all imperfect sinners. Amen? So what did they do? One by one, they started dropping their stones and walking away. And then Jesus said, woman, where are your condemners? He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He showed her love and compassion, though he did not approve or accept her sinful behavior. Amen? The love and tenderness that Jesus showed her set her free and transformed her, and she left the presence of Jesus a changed woman. She no longer sought for love and acceptance through the things she did or through the love of men. 
She simply accepted God's unconditional, unqualified love, and it set her free from her life of sin. Now, I want us to see that unconditional love is not a passive acceptance of wrongdoing, but it's an active choice to keep loving and extend grace and forgiveness. This is how Jesus has loved us. He continues to love us, and he continues to show us grace and forgiveness, even though we sin and we repent and we fall short and we repent and we keep disappointing him and hurting his heart, right? Hopefully we're growing and that's happening less and less because that's what spiritual growth is about, amen? But none of us, as I said, has yet attained perfection, but he still loves us, he still shows us grace, and he still forgives us. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's how he calls us to love one another just as he has loved us. We, the church, the family of God, are to be the instruments of his unconditional love towards one another. And it is his love flowing through us that enables us to love this way. Because as we experience his unconditional love through, first of all, his spirit, because the Bible says the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So we first experience the unconditional love of God through his spirit. And as we experience his unconditional love through the body of Christ, through our brothers and sisters in Christ, it transforms us. And when people come into our midst and experience the unconditional love of Christ through us, they feel the love of God. They feel accepted and valued regardless of their flaws or mistakes. And this enables them to begin to respond to God's love and, and see themselves the way that God sees them. They begin to realize their value to God, their value as a child of God. And so they begin to develop a healthy, God-centered sense of self-worth. Being unconditionally loved enables others to experience healing and restoration from past hurts because they feel safe to be vulnerable and to open up their struggles. And in such an atmosphere, they find healing and restoration as they receive support, as they receive prayer, as they receive encouragement, as they receive forgiveness from others in the church family. When people experience the unconditional love of God through their church family, they are empowered to let go of their fears and insecurities and embrace their gifts and strengths to fulfill the calling and purpose that God has for them. When people experience the unconditional love of God through their church family, their hearts and minds are transformed and they are freed to be able to love others and extend grace and forgiveness to them. When we're loved unconditionally, we learn to love unconditionally. If we're going to live together forever in eternity, we need to learn to love each other now. Amen? It's preparation for eternity. And thankfully, God doesn't leave us alone in this area. Amen? His Holy Spirit is there to help us. The church body is there to help us. What we need to understand is that we are the church together, not individually. The church is a people who have been called out to follow Jesus together. To follow Jesus together. Time and again, we read in the Gospels how Jesus called individuals to be his disciples saying, follow me. And they left everything and they followed him. And when they followed Jesus, they automatically joined the group of his band of followers known as the disciples. To follow Jesus is to join a group of fellow believers. We call it the church. We call it the family of God. No one followed Jesus alone. Following Jesus was a group experience. Wherever he went, the 12 went with him, and there was a group of women who couldn't have the official title of disciple in that culture, but they also followed him, the Bible says. They followed him wherever he went. So no one followed Jesus alone. This calling to follow me created the church. The word in Greek is ekklesia, and it means called out once. He called them out to follow him. He has called us out to follow him. And as we answer that call, we immediately become connected to one another. After Jesus' ascension, his followers continued to meet together. And here is one of the descriptions, the first descriptions of the early church in Acts 
all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. The word fellowship in Greek is koinonia, and it means to share your life together, to share a common life. We share the common life of Jesus together. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to sharing their lives together and to sharing in meals. See, they were socializing together, right? Including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. Now, the thing is that a lot of believers today, they do the first part of that. They devote themselves to the, to the church's teaching. They'll come and listen to a sermon, disappear right after the service, and not participate in anything else that is essential to our spiritual life. We can't be the church just by listening to sermons. We have to participate and share our life together. As you read on in this passage in Acts 2, it describes how this group of early believers worshiped together in the temple and they got together daily in one another's homes and they shared meals and they praised God together and they prayed together and they helped one another in times of need and that became so attractive to the unsaved that they had favor and honor with the unsaved. The unsaved were looking at them and saying, look how different these people live and love one another and as a result, the Bible says, daily God was adding to the church those that would be saved the church was growing because the love that they saw amongst God's people was so attractive folks the church is a people who have been called out of the world to follow Jesus together a people who gather together for worship for teaching for fellowship for socializing and to engage in his mission you cannot church alone hello there is no such thing as a one-man army and there's no such thing as a one-man church you cannot church alone and something else we need to understand the church is not a collection of individuals who meet together on Sundays the church is a local part of the family of God which stretches around the world and throughout time into eternity. And as the family of God, we share our lives together, not only in church on Sundays, but outside of church during the week. Just as the early church met together regularly in the temple once a week, but they also met together daily outside of the temple and they ate meals together and they prayed together and they worshiped together and they witnessed together. Amen. We enjoy, if we're part of the family of God, we enjoy spending time together inside and outside of our church meetings. Our lives are intertwined with one another because we experience koinonia. We are sharing our lives together. We're sharing that common life of following the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I encourage you, don't just come to Sunday services. Participate in the life of the family of God. Get involved in the ministries of the church. Go to the various fellowships. Join a life group when they're offered. That's where relationships are built. That's where you begin to share that common life of the family of God. After church, invite someone out to coffee or lunch. That's where relationships are built. Amen? Church is not a building. Church is not a building where we gather. It's not a service we attend. It is the family of God. It's all about relationship. It's about belonging. It's about participating in one another's lives as we grow together in Christ. God never intended us to live the Christian life alone. He created and designed the church to be a united family bound together in the love of Christ where we love one another and we mutually encourage, support, pray, and, 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 and assist one another. There are at least 54 times in the New Testament that the, church, that the Bible tells us to do something to one another. 54 one another's in the Bible. And I'll said, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. You cannot one another by yourself. One person cannot want another. There's got to be another. Amen? 
So you got to have relationships in the body of Christ. If not, you're going to be disobeying 54 of the Lord's commands. If you're disobeying 54 of the Lord's commands, that's a lifestyle of disobedience. And if you're living a lifestyle of disobedience, you can't be pleasing to God. Amen? That may just call in question your salvation if you're disobeying that much of God's word. Amen? It's getting quiet in here, but that's okay. The church is not a collection of individuals who come together concerned about their own prosperity, their own healing, their own entertainment, their own success, their own experience. The church is a family. We belong to one another. We love one another. We support one another. We encourage one another. We pray for one another. We use our gifts to serve one another and bless one another and a whole lot more one another's. Amen? And as we want another in the family of God, not only are we living in obedience to God's commands, but it fills our lives with joy and meaning, and it blesses our lives with love and belonging in God's forever family. And the first step to becoming a part of God's forever family is to be born again. We are born into God's family. And the way we are born into his family is to repent of our sins and place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we have all sinned. We have fallen short of God's standard, and we were cut off from God. And that's the reason that Jesus came, lived a sinless life, and died on the cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for sin that we deserve. But the moment that we repent of our sins, and repent means to make a U-turn, we recognize we've been heading in the wrong direction, living a life without regard to God, and we make a U-turn. We say, God, I don't want to live that way anymore. Forgive me. And we turn to God in faith. And the moment that we do that, Jesus says we're born again, we're made spiritually alive, and we are brought into relationship with God. He is our Father, and we as his children. Would you bow your heads with me if you're here today, and you would say, pray for me, Pastor. I want to repent of my sins i want to place my faith in jesus because i want to be forgiven and i want to be a part of god's family i want to have a relationship with god or maybe you did that several years ago and drifted away and you know you need to come back but in either case if you would say pray for me pastor i want to repent of my sins be forgiven and have a relationship with god if that's you would you just slip your hand up and you can put it right back down Pray for me, Pastor. I want to come to Jesus. Amen. I want to have my sins forgiven. Thank you for that hand. Is there someone else this morning? Pray for me, Pastor. I want to come to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You can put your hands down. I'm going to ask those of you that raised your hand, if you'll do one more thing, is just pray a simple prayer with me. And church, I'm going to ask you to pray that prayer along with those that are praying it for the first time today as an encouragement. Would you pray this prayer, dear Jesus? I believe that you are the Son of God, and I believe that you love me so much that you died for my sins. Today, I repent. I turn away from my sinful life, and I turn to you in faith. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, and I invite you to come live inside of me and help me from this day forward to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. If you prayed that prayer, we want to congratulate you on making the best decision of your life. And we want to, inv uh, we want to uh, help you to grow because that prayer was a beginning, not an ending. It's the beginning of a lifelong journey of learning to love and live for the Lord. And we want to help you in that journey by sending you free of charge a little e-booklet that will help you understand the prayer you just prayed and the next steps to take to keep growing in the Lord. But to send you that free e-booklet, we need your email address. So if you wouldn't mind, if you would just email, if you would just text your email address to the number on the screen, and we will send you that e-booklet free of charge. Amen. But once again, congratulations and welcome to the family of God. Amen. <laughs> For those of us who are already believers, God is calling us to fall in love with his church all over again. If we love God our, as our father, then we must love his church. He says, if we say we love God and we don't love our fellow believers, we're a liar. So if we love God, we must love his church, his family, his sons and his daughters, despite all of our failures and shortcomings. 
And the church is the family of God where we are loved unconditionally and where we learn to love unconditionally despite our shortcomings. So today, let's pray and ask God to help us to fall in love with his church all over again, to feel about his church the way that he feels. Let's pray that we would love his church the way he loves the church. And let's ask him to help us learn to love one another unconditionally and actively share our lives together as we grow in Christ. If that's your heart's desire, would you stand to your feet right where you are this morning? And we're all going to talk to Jesus from our heart today. You just have a conversation with God right now, and you ask him to help you fall in love with his church and to learn to love each other unconditionally. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you, Lord, for all of these that are standing. I thank you, Lord God, that they have a heart that is open to you and to your word, Lord God, and that they have a willingness and a readiness to respond in faith and say, yes, Lord, I want to obey your word. I want to follow your word. I want to live the way that you want me to live. And today, the way you're calling us to live is to live our lives as a part of the family of God, to live our lives loving your church the way that you love your church, Lord God. So, Father, right now, if we've had any hurts, any disappointments with anyone in the church or in a church in the past that has disillusioned us or affected us, right now we lay it down. We surrender it to you. We ask you to help us to release it, to forgive it, and heal us from it. And, Father, we pray that you would renew our hearts, that just as your word says that the Holy Spirit sheds abroad your love in our heart, Lord God. Fill us with your love, not just our experience of your love, but your love for your people, your love for your church as well, Lord God. Help us to fall in love with your church all over again, Lord God, that we may love your people, your church, your family, the way that you do, Lord God. And Father, today we make a commitment that you would help us, Lord God, to participate in the family of God. That we would become engaged in relationships within the family of God. That we would truly share in koinonia, sharing our lives together in this journey of living for and loving you. Father, we make this commitment to you today and we ask the help of your Holy Spirit so that it will not just be words that we pray at the end of a service, but that we would put it into action, Lord God, that we might become the people, the church, the family that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. If you were blessed by this message, would you consider giving a gift to help support our ministry? You can text any amount to 844-723-4904. That's 844-723-4904. Thank you, and we hope you'll join us again.